and welcome. This is the House Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives, and it's Friday, April 17th. And today we are going to be talking about a COVID response in relation to pre-K education and continuity of learning. And while normally I would start with the secretary, what I wanted to do instead was just get an idea from the ground so we would have a context to put some of the things into. So I wanted to invite um, Meg uh, Baker to speak to us. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to testify just to the pre-K education and continuity of learning guidance that was issued on the 13th. Um, and just to give you a little context, I am the universal pre-K coordinator for Addison County. The three districts here are Addison Central, Addison Northwest, and the Mount Abe uh, USD um, program. Uh, districts. And we have about 35 pre K private pre K partnerships, um, serving about 350 children between those three districts. Uh, we have some pretty significant concerns about the guidance that has just come out indicating that districts are um, to provide the continuity of learning to all of those children, whether they were enrolled in a school building or in the pre-qualified private program. We, um, we feel as though the, the programs themselves, the private programs are best placed to offer those ongoing relationships with the children and their families um, to support children and to monitor ongoing educational progress. And most of our private partners are doing that. Um, they are offering the ongoing connections. They're providing circle times and read alouds and child development information and learning activities. Um, and through our contracts, they have full responsibility for general education of those students. Um, so we've been providing supports, but to be perfectly frank, we do not have a capacity within our district to provide supports uh, direct instruction to 350 additional children. Um, my position is a halftime one and I personally can't do it. And we have limited capacity within uh, for teaching pre-K students within each of our three districts. The other question mark I have is we've been directed in that guidance to provide um, funding and I've uh, ongoing funding to programs, which we have already made our final payments through the end of the school year, and I do not want to remove those. However, the guidance that was re recently issued indicated we should, un we should provide those payments even if the children were unenrolled from the program. Um, and this was in response to the way that the stabilization um, funds from the CDD are being run is in order for a program to get 100% of tuition, they have to unenroll the child entirely. But we can't provide pre-K education fund money if there's not an actual child attached to that money, I don't think. I think there's some, some concerns there. Um, it would be a simple enough matter, I think, to unenroll them for all of the child care hours and not unenroll them for the pre-K hours, right? So the parents are only paying for that, the childcare hours. There's no cost associated uh, for the family with the pre-K hours because the district pays for those entirely. So if we could un unenroll them 100% from childcare and not from those 10 hours, they could receive their continuity of learning. And I think that that problem would, would dissipate. And that continuity of learning would be provided by the private providers. Is that That's correct? right. And we provide supports and um, special education, ongoing special education supports. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, we'll probably want to get, and maybe, um, maybe the, uh, the deputy commissioner can talk a little bit about some of the, the unenrolling language because that's, I'm not familiar with that one. Um, but are there any questions for Meg at this point? We're also going to hear from, just so people know, we're going to hear from um, Champlain Valley and we're going to hear from Burlington as well for on the ground reports. But I thought that this would help um, give us a start to understand uh, the magnitude of the challenge. 
So, Mr. Secretary. Good afternoon. The, um, that's good to see you all. The, uh, in terms of the guidance, uh, the guidance came out, I think, uh, over the weekend. Um, and, you know, just to sort of set the rationale for the guidance, one is that uh, the governor's original emergency order um, prescribed that continuity of learning would include pre-K. So, um, you know, as so we started to formulate how pre-K would be implemented under uh, continuity of learning, um, first thing is to acknowledge is that pre-K is in included. It's not, it wasn't meant, to, there's no opportunity really to set it aside or come up with another strategy. It's, it needs to be included. Uh, secondly, as mentioned, um, the issue of maintaining 166 tuition payments has been a consistent requirement throughout uh, this emergency period, and that's uh, tied directly to this rationale of economic stability. It's basically the same strategy that's been employed to require school districts to pay their employees um, for the rest of the year as well regardless uh, in the case of uh, hourly employees, regardless of their, whether they're working or not, or whether they're doing something else than their assigned function. So school districts are required to pay their employees in accordance with their regular scheduled hours and um, teachers and so forth for the remainder of the school year. Once again, as an economic stability strategy. So this guidance reaffirms that issue uh, that school districts are required to pay their 166 tuition contracted amounts, regardless of whether students are enrolled in the programs or regardless of whether the provide, private providers are operating. Uh, most private providers have been shut down as per the governor's directive. Um, they were, uh, if you remember that transition when we were providing care for essential persons, uh, the provider providers uh, subsequently were ordered to uh, shut down, like most businesses in the state, uh, with the exception to the extent that they're providing services to the children of essential persons. So um, the previous speaker, I forgot her name, but the issue, just to clarify, um, this issue of 50-50 unenrolled enrolled is not really germane to this requirement that districts must continue to pay their 166 payments. That whole conversation is something CTV can testify more to about how that's a that's a separate economic stability initiative about how to help parents and uh, support their child care needs. But districts, from a district perspective, they are continued to require to pay the 160 tuition payment, whether a student's enrolled, whether even the provider's even operating any services, they're required to provide that payment. That's been consistent throughout the entire emergency. Once again, it's an economic stability strategy. So you know, based on these considerations that were required to do pre-K under continuity of learning and that the economic stability mechanism needs to be maintained in place, we had to navigate how to, how to ensure uh, that I would, I would suggest that these children are some of our most vulnerable children. How do we, how do we ensure that these students uh, are main, at least maintain contact with through this period? And uh, I would say, firstly, that the issue, the, the question has comes up often as a reaction to the guidance is how come we don't have private providers do this? Once again, private providers to a large extent are no longer operating per the, the governor's directive. Um, yes, there are cases apparently like in this district where they are providing some services, but for the most part, they are not operating right now. So we don't have that infrastructure necessarily available to us to provide services. Secondly, can I just, just interrupt you there because I get confused when I hear that because everything's closed. <laughs> right. People are still working. So um, I know they're not operating, but they're. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> typical Zoom. I, you know what I'm trying to say when I try to find Yeah, that. yeah. I'll just wait to stop sharing. Yeah. Un Unlike school districts, school districts are shut down for the purposes of in-person instruction, but they are still operating, you know, in this form of continuity of learning. Private providers, like other businesses, are not open, essentially. They are shut down. Um, but my second point to that was, even in cases where they are operating, for the most part, um, particularly as we get into more of our... I'm sorry, 
the um, for the most part, many of these providers do not have the infrastructure to uh, deliver continuity of learning remotely. That's never what they were designed to do. And it's been challenging enough for our public infrastructure to navigate that. We didn't think it was appropriate to require privates to try to do that as well. So our sort of remedy to that was to firstly back away from this idea of 166 and the 10 hours of instruction. And I think that's where a lot of the tensions emerging that districts interpret the guidance to, to mean that they are required to provide 10 hours of instruction to these students who they haven't previously providing services. That's not what the guidance says. The guidance is really about trying to provide emotional and emotion, uh, focus on social and emotional support for students because we think public infrastructure is the really the only infrastructure available to do that right now. It's also precisely the time of the year where districts are starting to get involved with kindergarten screenings and so forth. So we thought it would also uh, fit nicely with those activities as they're starting to reach out to families and run those sort of uh, activities that they also could also reach out on the basis of, do you need anything? Here are supports and here are other other services that are available from other agencies and so forth. So, you know, that's, that's sort of the context of the guidance. I think it is as, you know, the prior uh, individual testifying says, as you know, we have a very diverse uh, delivery system in all aspects of our education system, including pre-K. So um, there are places where the guidance, I think, needs needs further refinement in terms of implementation. And I expect Burlington's needs to be totally different or, or Champlain Valley's needs to be totally different than Canyon's needs. Um, so that's... I have a question. That's where, yeah, that's where to, um, you know, if if the concern from Addison Central has pre was just presented to us for further refinement, I would suggest that they're in a good place to, they're fulfilling their requirement. If they think private providers are online providing those services, then they, and they are essentially the contractors, the district is the contractor in that regard. Um, so the district should feel comfortable that they're meeting the requirements of the guidance. Um, so we could follow up with further refinement along those lines for folks, but it's very similar to how we started the emergency where um, we asked public school districts to provide childcare and many districts could not do that well without contracting that service out for other providers. And that's where we started to provide that flexibility. To, in some districts, they did that. I'm thinking St. Johnsbury is a good example where they, they literally said, we, we really don't do this, but we have these strong relationships in our community. Could we contract out our obligation essentially to a third party? And the answer was yes. So I think you know we're, our intention with the guidance is to navigate um, our sort of our complex delivery system, but um, the, the central issues are we have to, districts do need to address the continent of learning somehow. And then secondly, that the um, economic stability component, the Act 166 payments must continue regardless of whether children are enrolled or not. I think, I think most people understand the need for economic stability. Peter Carman has a question. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm a little troubled. I mean, I'm, I'm the, the school district that I'm from, 80% of pre-K is provided by private providers. And the idea that there's some, that the school district is somehow gonna take on all of those kids for continuity of learning is, is I think basically impossible. But then you get to this concept of contracting it out because where you're delivering a couple of different messages here. One is uh, private centers are shut down. Yet at the same time, they're also receiving economic money, especially if they're more than just a 10 hour a week pre-K, their clients have to be paying 50% in order to maintain their slots. The government's picking up the other 50%. They're still maintaining their, um, their pre-K payments. Yet what I'm hearing is that they don't actually have any obligation to provide continuity of learning to the pre-K students that are under their care. That's correct. And you have not, you don't have any kind of data or, or accounting for where the challenges are, because it sounds like some districts are fine that the private providers are well prepared to take this on. Yeah, I think it's early, as I mentioned, the guidance just came out this weekend. So 
you know, we've, we've, as we've had with all these emergency guidance issues, we've had to iterate our way through this. So we'll no doubt refine our approach based on uh, the needs of the field to deliver the services. But, um, you know, as we did earlier with early childcare, you know, once again, it's a very uh, diverse delivery model. So it's not surprising to me that one set of guidance doesn't serve all areas of the state, but we certainly would work very closely with districts to provide additional guidance and, and, and go back and even refine our guidance as necessary. I am hoping that that you will be able to do that. You know, we do have more testimony coming today. I realize that you can't stay for all of it. Is Kate in the room? Uh, Kate unfortunately had to uh, go out of state on an emergency and a family issue, okay. so she won't be with us. But I would just encourage folks. I know it's. Um, I think it's very useful to have folks testify, uh, necessarily to inform future legislation. But they also have the opportunity to feed their feedback right back into us, and that helps. I mean, that's why how the guidance has worked to date. I mean, it's been an iterative process. But I think you know it's uh, as you you probably know better than anyone else. Um, the diversity of the delivery system is, is such that it requires us to kind of, uh, you know, figure a path forward, um, but it's, it's not necessarily going to happen sooner rather than later if they share that guidance with you and not directly with us, so, or those concerns, so we encourage them to do that. Um, but That's the, the issue of, <clears throat> the issue to what extent private providers are available to not is really, I mean, the status is right now, they're not operating and they certainly, you know, with pre-K in particular, um, most of those services are provided in person for sure. Um, but I think, you know, we, uh, our, re our, our guidance to date uh, is meant to establish that sort of baseline by which we can uh, uh, pivot and provide direction to everyone. But I, I would say the, <clears throat> to emphasize the point on economic stability, uh, when you've made the comment that's obvious to folks, uh, it isn't necessarily obvious to people. And uh, particularly as uh, the other guidance that was coming out from CDD, this was one of the points, and I think the prior person spoke to this, is that there, there was a point of confusion where um, CDD was, was speaking, once again, we have this dual agency oversight of pre-K, as you're well aware. Um, CDD was implementing a brand new program as a result of the emergency to support parents and and then we and then the intersection with 166 where a lot of these let's say the the impetus and from a regulatory standpoint is to comply with regulation as it was written previously though to a certain extent um, what we're talking about in terms of pre-k is not what 166 requires we're not you know specifically telling people to have parents walk around with ts gold checklists to verify the number of hours and so forth we just really want to take the pressure off folks to feel that they need to comply with those kinds of things and really um, similar to our broader continuity of learning strategies to focus on what our student needs are right now which are certainly academic but particularly with this age group more appropriately social and emotional security are there any other questions for the secretary Um, I'm going to, I, what I'd like to do now, I think I'm going to get one more comment from the ground because I think it helps inform our questions that we're asking you. So I'd like to um, go to Nathan Lavery and Stacy Curtis. So Nathan. Hey, good morning or afternoon rather, I guess it is at this point, everyone. Thanks for, for having us here. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, the business manager at the Burlington School District. And I am also on the Vermont Association of School Business Officials Executive Board as the president-elect. And I'm here also with Stacy Curtis, who is our Director of Preschool Education and Early Learning. And um, we wanted to take a few minutes to share some feedback as well. We were concerned when we read the new guidance from the Agency of Education. You heard some of it already. And, and just to give you an example, in Burlington, we are similarly concerned about the um, fact that we don't have excess staff that's qualified to instruct preschool students. So in Burlington's case, for example, we have over 300 students just in Burlington in private preschool partner programs. So um, there's no way from a kind of caseload size that we could take on an additional 300 students and expect to provide anything resembling a continuity of education to, to those students. Um, and of course, we're, I'm kind of equally concerned and I know they're, they're much smaller uh, schools and school districts around the state who uh, may law, by and large have preschool programs that are run entirely by the private providers, in which case 
they're clearly not going to be equipped staff wise to have licensed preschool teachers available to serve those students. So um, no one would really expect this at a, at a K-12 level. So it's not clear to me why this is, um, you know, been put in place for, for preschool students. But one of the, um, I guess in my, in my effort to kind of make sure that I, I'm not alone in this, I did speak with some of my colleagues, for example, in, in the Essex Westford district and in Maple Run and so a couple of other large, larger districts and they expressed some similar concerns. So in terms of just staff capacity alone to deliver continuity of um, instruction services, it, it really isn't going to be there. And, um, but you know, that's not the only thing to consider. Obviously there are, there's other questions about like, even if we had the capacity, how effectively could we, could we serve students? And for that, I want to turn it over to Stacy Curtis, who could talk a little bit more about the um, kind of social emotional elements of preschool instruction and how we try to serve students now versus what we would conceivably be able to do in response to this guidance. Nathan, I just want to ask you one, one quick question before that. Sure. Um, you have 300 students. How many pre-K providers are you working with, do you think? Um, that's a good question. I want to say maybe 40 or so. Do you think that, St Stacey, am I close in that ballpark? Yeah, you're in the ballpark. I think it's 48. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, let me just see if there are any questions for Nathan, and then sure. let's, let's go on then to Stacy. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I, similar to what Meg said, um, our size is similar. We're a really large district. And I think during this time, my teachers and staff have been focusing first on serving and getting things set up for continuous learning for the children in our eight classrooms. So we do serve another 180 students already in our Burlington School District classroom. So when you add in that plus 300, we're talking over 500 students um, that we'd be looking at now providing continuous of learning. And I think as many of you know, we have been really focused on this, you know, uh, shared trauma that we're all experiencing at some level and what kids will come back looking like after not being in school this long. Um, and we do serve a really high population of needy children and families. So um, amongst the calls that we've been making and contacting the 180 students, we've had a wide variety of concerns shared with us from parents just not wanting any engagement from, from the school at this point. They just can't manage it. They have three other children in the district and social emotional needs, that's what we're focusing on. So we are documenting that. But I think most importantly, when I heard this guidance that was concerning is just, when you think about continuously continuous learning and what that means in preschool, that's all about relationships and connecting with families. And it's really challenging. And I don't know how we would expect a new families to make connections with teachers they don't know, they have had zero contact with. They, they um, know us, uh, we pay the provider. So, um, Similar to Meg, Meg, I do know that there's providers in Burlington that are providing um, some, you know, uh, check-ins with their families. They're doing things Facebook and using, um, you know, classroom hangouts and things like that. So, I guess um, what I was hoping is just to get some some more clarity on what the expectation is for continuous learning for this age group. Um, I mean, we do have all of our materials shared on our website. We have them shared um, on the Burlington School District website, our early ed website, as well as. Um, had shared with partner programs that we um, meet with regularly. I have regular meetings with those directors. So I guess I get concerned about what level, um, especially when we think of tracking attendance and um, progress. I know we're not doing spring checkpoints, but what does that look like um, for those 500 students? Because I certainly don't have the staff to do that. Yeah, thanks, Stacy. And so, um, you know, to kind of wrap it up, I, I do want to touch that the the point was made and that the questions were raised about the payments to private partner programs. Uh, we are continuing to make those payments, as I said earlier. That is that is the law, and so uh, and we are frankly happy to do that. We know that the private providers are the providers who have the relationships with those students. We certainly want them not only to come out the other side of of this pandemic, you know, equipped to return to serving those students. But they're obviously also best positioned to provide whatever measure of service they can realistically provide to those students at this time. I think it's important to take a moment to respond um, directly to a few of the, the things that Secretary French said, because I think they're important observations. In particular, he mentioned the fact that, um, you know, those private providers are, are shut down and therefore can't do that work. But uh, I guess I would remind the Secretary that that shutdown was uh, part of the guidance issued by the governor in his in his executive order, and we saw just today that in fact the that guidance can change and it can be changed where it's appropriate to change it, and that's already happening. So 
I think in this case, um, given that we have demonstrated uh, across you know, the state examples of private providers who are able to provide meaningful relationship-based continuity of learning services to their preschool students, it makes a lot of sense to take advantage of the great work that those folks do and allow them to continue to do that work rather than expecting public schools to create new relationships um, by the time, frankly, that we would even be able to establish those relationships, the school year is going to be over. So it's not going to deliver anything um, along the lines of what is, is being represented. And I think at times we run the risk of over-promising something. At the, you know, everyone, everyone wants to do, do well, and, and we have these um, ambitious desires to, to provide a level of service. But realistically, saying that school, public schools should provide a continuity of learning is different from actually delivering it. And it's simply impossible to deliver it at a, on a significant scale, given um, the time frame and the resources that we have at our disposal. Thank you. The private providers that you work with, how many are actually within your district? Um, within our district, it's about half. So somewhere around the 20. Yeah. 20 are within with your district. Others are how far away? Um, they could be up to Essex, Milton, um, South Burlington. Yeah. And just to clarify too, we are similar to Meg still in, um, providing services to children on IEPs that are in partner programs. That's been the plan all along, um, as well as connecting with, um, again, like I said, those directors that are running programs. Thank you. Questions from the committee? Um, Sarita Austin. Um, I just want to clarify, my understanding is, and maybe I'm, I'm, this isn't correct, that all public and private pre-Ks are responsible for implementing the Vermont Early Learning Standards. Is that, okay, so is that, are you saying that that's kind of difficult to do right now, but in the regular school year and a, a normal time that is being done by all the private pr providers? Yes. Okay, yep, just wanted to clarify, thank you. That's, that's uh, just to be clear, that's not what we're asking folks to do in the emergency right. context, you know, so right. yep. that's part of the tension, I think, is, you know, uh, Mr. Laverty used the phrase service. I mean, what we carefully phrased, I think, and probably needs further embellishment is we're asking districts to support, not necessarily to serve. Um, because we don't, we don't think, you know, no one has a game plan for this, but we don't think, continuity learning for pre-K students through remote learning look should look anything near like what it might be for a fifth grader, you know. Thank you. Anybody else? The committee's quiet today. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we go, I do not think that Megan Roy is in the room yet, is she? She's not here yet. <clears throat> I'm gonna leave, I'll say goodbye. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Okay, Steve, um, Deputy Commissioner from DCF. Welcome to the you. Education Committee. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and Representatives. Uh, for the record, I'm Stephen Brebeco, Deputy Commissioner, Child Development Division. Unfortunately, Melissa Regal Garrett, our Policy Director, isn't able to join us this afternoon. Um, I, um, I have a, a brief report from our perspective here in CDD, and I'd like to keep it brief because I see that you have uh, other witnesses uh, ready to give testimony, and I want to make sure that they have an opportunity to share their stories. Uh, we're seeing uh, many cases of early childhood educators who are still on payroll, who are providing uh, a tremendous service to children and families by uh, connecting with them uh, and connecting with each other. Uh, in some cases, they connect with families and children through um, media uh, like what we're using right now, uh, teleconferencing. <clears throat> in other cases, uh, through preparing and dropping off activity bags uh, for children uh, and their families to use during this response period. And those educators uh, are connecting with each other. Uh, that's what we're seeing. Uh, they're connecting with each other through uh, forums that are put on by the early the Vermont Early Childhood uh, Network uh, and also uh, through uh, Let's Grow Kids. Uh, I don't mean to take any thunder out of uh, Ali's testimony, 
uh, but are really excited that they had a forum just yesterday with uh, about 160 participants and that speaks to the strong interest among early childhood educators uh, in sharing best practices and supporting each other uh, during this time. Uh, and <clears throat> sorry, uh, and uh, uh, that's that's pretty much a sum of what we have. Uh, our role in CDD uh, is uh, as a support uh, for this uh, collaboration. Uh, so, for instance, when Building Bright Futures has their online forum uh, to discuss early childhood uh, education in Vermont. Uh, we follow up by uh, taking down all of the questions that are uh, shared in the chat box during the forum. Uh, and we use uh, that to generate our FAQs uh, back to the field to make sure that uh, we're all aware of uh, what's going on and as informed as we can be. So it sounds like, you know, you're right. Do we have early childhood educators in the public programs and we have early childhood educators in the private programs and they're all, they all have, they're all educated and licensed. Um, so you are seeing that there is good conversation going on in the community. Do you, is that correct? Uh, yes, ma'am. Do you see that as being, um, do you see that they are totally capable of taking this on with some areas of weakness, of course, but they are capable of taking this on even though they're not operating? I, I have a strong belief in our state's cater of uh, early childhood educators uh, and their ability to uh, teach our youth uh, as well as their ability to adjust and adapt uh, to new circumstances. So I would agree because I have traveled around the state and I've seen amazing, amazing teachers in both the public and the private programs and it, it's inspiring. So I am, um, would you be able to support the concept, uh, you know, with the, with the secretary of saying that sure that the, the privates could possibly be held uh, more accountable? They are getting paid. Um, this is, uh... So the, the recent guidance uh, that has been um, promulgated by the Agency of Education is something that we're all looking at uh, actively. Uh, in fact, uh, this afternoon, uh, there was a Building Bright Futures Forum planned to discuss the continuity of learning for pre-K educators. Uh, unfortunately, that, that had been canceled uh, because uh, both Kate Rogers and Melissa Regal Garrett were unavailable. Uh, but that speaks to the attention that we're giving to uh, this new guidance and uh, our interest in finding um, <clears throat> the best way forward uh, to support our educators in the field. Great, because the secretary wants to make sure that people aren't just coming to us, that they're going to him. So I'm hoping that you will be able to work with him as well. I'm, I'm grateful for a very positive working relationship with the secretary and our colleagues in AUE. Okay, questions for DCF? And I am gonna go on to Tracy Sawyers. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, so, um, for the record, Tracy Sawyer is Executive Director of the Vermont Council of Special Ed Administrators. Um, and thank you as always for having me. Um, so as you've heard and you've seen the guidance document, um, it instructs school districts to develop remote learning plans for preschool children who are enrolled in, enrolled in the community-based uh, private programs under Act 166. Um, and if we are gonna hold to an expectation that there's a continuation of learning for these children. It also seems that we should be expecting private providers to provide access to learning, given they've accepted the public funds and again, that the funds are being paid out. Um, and most importantly, because they have relationships with the children and families. So it seems important to have them stay connected um, and be in contact with those kids um, as their teachers. And as it's been, um, already stated, schools don't know these children and families. Um, and from our perspective, it's unrealistic and impossible to expect public school teachers to take on new students at this time, which this really 
um, is, and it seems in direct conflict with the idea of continuity, um, just um, fundamentally. I think trying to provide distance pre-K to a significant number of children for whom school districts don't have relationships with seems highly um, problematic um, from a policy perspective. And um, also school districts are having a hard time connecting with a number of their own families as you've been hearing. Um, so, um, you know, trying to connect with these families um, who they don't know and the families don't know them um, would be very challenging. And as it's um, been said, there's a capacity issue here, given just how much schools are doing anyway across the board right now. Um, and this is not an insignificant number of children as we've heard, it's a couple hundred in most and in ones that we've heard from today, three to up to three to 400 kids in addition to the other children um, they're serving. Um, so VCSEA totally supports all children continuing to be connected with um, educators and we support learning to the greatest extent possible during this time. And that's really the core of the continuity of learning. Um, we also um, very much support paying the providers um, and not further imploding the system. Um, however, there's been an agreement um, by private providers to perform on behalf of the public system. And it seems odd that we would not expect them to provide continuity of learning to the children that are in their Act 166 slots. And even if the rationale is that the private provider has been ordered to cease operation, it does seem appropriate to bring them back to do this work and especially um, feels okay because they're getting paid for that. I think expecting school districts to kind of simply do this um, for all the kids who are part of private provider programs seems like an unusual request as opposed to expecting their current educators to stay at the table. Um, I think what's that's what's best for kids, um, especially three and four year olds to have continuation of learning from their known providers and teachers um, who could use AOE and school district websites for resources if necessary. Um, so I think you've heard a lot of this, you'll hear more, um, but I just wanna also say that I think this highlights the well-documented challenges with the Act 166 construct um, that we've discussed at length. Um, including dual oversight um, and, a, and a whole bunch of other pieces around capacity, equity, design, complexity, and just meeting the needs of children and families. And I think we're gonna have a lot of reflecting and rethinking to do in so many areas um, when we get through this. And this is certainly one of them. Um, so I know you have several witnesses and uh, we have some similar testimony, so I'll stop, um, but, I think um, we just really appreciate you taking this uh, testimony today. And this is another area um, of significant concern and um, that we feel is not possible. And we really need guidance to be implementable and make sense um, both to the state um, and to districts. So thank you. Thank you. One of the things that we are, are finding is that that may be one of the uses of our committee uh, during this time to, to really be bearing witness as to what's happening on the ground uh, to, and some of it to actually inform future. Um, so I think Jay Nichols, President's Association. And that'll be followed by Sandra and Chelsea. Good afternoon. Thanks for having yeah, me today. One of the things that we are, are finding. Oh, people hear me okay now? Yeah. Okay. So Jay Nichols, for the record, Executive Director of the Vermont Principals Association. I think what you just said is kind of it's very important. Um, you know, I think I told this committee before the Raman Emanuel quote about don't let a crisis go to waste. <clears throat> so we should be thinking about how we can move forward and position ourselves in a better way to provide services for all kids once we get through this crisis. So thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding guidance around pre-K during the time of the COVID-19 uh, remote learning process. I promise not to mention anything about four-year-olds being in public schools. Uh, this committee has heard me testify many times about issues with pre-K. The voucher program we have created will hopefully give you more access to more kids across the state, which I think in a way it has done, has led to an exasperation of inequities. The joint oversight provisions of the law, while well-intended in most cases, made it harder for schools to educate pre-K children. 
It's allowed for significant potential for lack of quality instruction in child care settings because there is no requirement for a qualified teacher being required to provide for all instruction as paid for by taxpayer, i.e. ed fund dollars. Many of these inequities can be seen in play right now. Now, under the current guidance on providing continuity of learning, school teachers and administrators are being asked to provide remote learning for students that they don't even know in many cases. <clears throat> these are students that were being served in non-school settings with a school district paying tuition for them out of the school district's budget. Well, currently, school districts are being asked to pay their regular Act 166 fees and tuition, while they are also being told to provide remote learning instruction for students that they don't know. Further enhancing the problem is that some places have many children in different settings, as you just heard Stacy Curtis testify to, that don't attend the school, and they might only have one or two preschool teachers that are providing the service. So there's a capacity issue there. So the teacher in school becomes responsible for teaching children uh, that they don't know, along with the children that they already do know that they're trying to reach out to. So this is, again, a huge capacity issue for schools and preschool teachers especially. I believe a better solution would be for private providers to continue to provide services to the students through a remote strategy similar to what schools are doing. And it sounds like many of them already are. Private providers presumably know where students are in their learning, so they're much better positioned to provide a continuity of learning plan. And they are also being paid, so it makes sense to ask them to provide the educational services they are being paid to provide. I agree with uh, Stephen uh, Burbaco that the privates do have the ability to provide these continuity of learning plans. And so I, I personally think the best path forward, and I don't think you can do much about this other than through a bully pulpit, is to ask the governor to amend his order to allow private programs to offer continuity of learning to students, and then to have the private programs use the local districts as resources for tools as necessary. So that, that's my quickest testimony of the year. You're on mute, Kate. I agree. <laughs> okay. I'm sure that we're going to we'll be able to open it up to the room in a little while. I think um, we don't have we don't have Megan yet. So Sandra and Chelsea and Allie, I know you are all uh, working on solution at some point. So maybe Sandra, um, you could talk with us a little bit about what you're seeing. <laughs> Unmute, unmute. Uh, maybe Avery, you could unmute her. Oh, oh. could you unmute her? Um, Sandra and I are testifying together. So while she's working on our audio, I'm happy to get us started if that works for you. Oh, I could. All set. Avery unmuted me. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. So thank you for having us. Um, for the record, Sandra Cameron, um, Policy Director for the Vermont School Boards Association, and Chelsea and I are going to do a joint testimony. Um, and Chelsea's, uh, Chelsea's going to lead us off. Um, for the record, Chelsea Myers from the uh, Vermont Superintendents Association. It's really good to virtually see you all again. Um, so thank you for inviting us to speak on behalf of the Vermont School Boards Association and the Vermont Superintendents Association on continuity of learning in Act 166 during the COVID-19 school closure period. Um, relationships and social and emotional development are at the forefront of continuity of learning for early learners. A number of states and local school systems have set developmentally appropriate recommendations of approximately 30 minutes of engagement per day for preschool students without requiring sustained attention for more than five minutes at a time. Um, key to successful distance learning for pre-K students is trusting relationships between students and adults, as we all know. On March 26, 2020, Governor Phil Scott directed schools to make preparations for the continuation of learning for students from pre-K to grade 12, as Secretary French um, stated, for the remainder of the 2019-2020 school year. Subsequent guidance from the Agency of Education specified the following in regards to pre-kindergarten education in Vermont. Continuity of learning for pre-K students as required through the governor's directive should be developmentally appropriate and focused on social and emotional development. Uh, this aligns with the national recommendations as well. 
The Agency of Education will provide developmentally appropriate learning resources to the field to help with the implementation of continuity of learning to pre-K students. School districts should support all resident pre-K students, including those that were served in private programs prior to the COVID-19 crisis. Private programs will continue to receive Act 166 funding regardless of their operational status. Given the state's mixed delivery model, there are many districts in which the majority of their resident pre-K students are served by private providers. As private programs have closed or dramatically reduced their operation, many of these students' continuity of learning will fall on public schools that have no prior relationships with the students or their families. There is a fundamental conflict here between the assumption that public school staff can meaning, meaningfully assume the responsibility for delivering a continuity of learning plan focused on social and emotional skills and the widely accepted theory that social and emotional skills are built through meaningful relationships. As stated in the Vermont Early Learning Standards or uh, otherwise known as the VELs, each and every child develops and learns um, trust and respect through nurturing, responsive and predictable relationships with family members, early childhood professionals and other adults and children. Currently, school districts are only staffed to support the needs of the students that attend their public pre-K programs. In some cases, districts are now asked to take on hundreds of new students and their families to support continuity of learning. To the best of our knowledge, there is no additional funding to support this new requirement and existing Act 166 tuition payments are being directed to private programs in order to support their financial stability during closure. There is conflicting information between the CDD Child Care Stabilization Program and the guidance issued by the Agency of Education, and we think that Meg Baker's testimony really spoke to this nicely. Um, I'm going to let Sandra take over from here. So I'll keep the video on as long as my computer screen doesn't freeze, uh, but if it does so, I will shut that off again. Uh, the responsibility of the public schools during the COVID-19 crisis has grown significantly and will continue to grow. Given the developmental needs of our youngest students and the fiscal and capacity constraints of the mixed delivery system to provide a continuity of learning for all pre-K students, we offer the following recommendations create a central location for resources for families of pre-K students. Um, and I have several examples, the Boston Department of Learning, New York City has an early childhood learn at home page, Miami-Dade County, County Public Schools has an instructional continuity plan specifically for pre-K, and the Indiana Department of Education has a COVID remote learning resource page specifically for pre-K. So certainly we could replicate something like um, other parts of the country have done. School districts should send communications to families regarding available resources through, um, for example, their websites, their community forums, email, and other means of communication. We don't believe that would be a significant hardship for school districts because the children are already registered. So we could certainly let children of um, private and public preschools know, um, let their families know where the resources are and how to access those. Um, public providers will continue to ensure the provision of early childhood special education services and support families of children with special needs to the greatest extent possible. Public and private providers that have existing relationships with students should connect with their students and direct them to the common location of resources. The Act 166 funds directed to providers can be used to support these one-to-one -one interactions with families. And I just wanted to um, share a response to something that I heard a little bit earlier, which is that um, child care centers have been closed down. Certainly, we have heard from many teachers who don't have great Wi-Fi access right now. They, they left their classrooms and perhaps left all of their materials there, and they are figuring it out. They're, they're you know, going to Wi-Fi spots. They are going to friends' houses as little as possible to make connections with families. So even though um, they are closed, so are school buildings and the teachers are finding ways to make this happen. Um, all agencies and programs that support pre-K students should collaborate um, to develop a system that connects students and families with essential support services. Um, in the wake of the crisis, the General Assembly will have an opportunity to reflect and act on our existing systems including how we educate and care for our youngest Vermonters. We ask that you consider the following observations from the COVID-19 crisis. 
the existing pre-K delivery system is not able to provide continuity of learning and support to all students. That's what the guidance suggests. School districts are being called upon to play the central role in assuring um, equity, quality, and accountability for all publicly funded pre-K students' continuity of learning. Shifting the responsibility of continuity of learning to public programs on behalf of private pre-K programs that are continuing to be paid regardless of whether the child continues to be enrolled points to significant fiscal instability in the system. The pressures on financial resources for education now and for the unforeseeable future will exacerbate the consequences of the existing fiscal and education delivery inefficiencies. All students will return to school with increased needs for support. It's abundantly clear that the COVID-19 crisis has far-reaching consequences. Vermont needs a clear vision for high quality, publicly funded early education and reliable and affordable childcare to contend with a new reality. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions now. So what I'll do is open it up to Allie and then I think that's it unless Megan's in the room and then we can open it up to the whole group. Thank you very much. And I'm really nice to see everyone. For the record, it's Allie Richards, CEO of Let's Grow Kids. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to let Let's Grow Kids share our perspective on providing pre-K services during this absolutely incredibly <clears throat> difficult time that we're all acknowledging. And um, as you know, Let's Grow Kids is trying to commit to ensuring that all children birth of five have access to high quality, affordable care. And um, we have been in this crisis moment, been able to work with programs in the, on the ground early educators, as well as the federal delegation, national groups and our administration to really just try to make sure early education programs get through this. That's where we are right now. They have to just get through this. So they can actually open. So we're incredibly grateful. I just have to note um, for the steps that the state of Vermont has taken across the board um, to ensure that actually families and employers and these early educators and our kids, most of all, are going to actually have childcare um, when the dust settles. So um, a big thank you for that with the continuation of both the CCFAP, the Act 166, and then the stabilization program that builds upon that. I just have a few very quick points. Um, so first of all, um, as many have already noted, in these incredibly stressful times and times of trauma and transition, early educators actually play an absolutely key role in supporting children and families. And as so many have said, it's built upon the trusting relationship and the expertise that they have to provide developmentally appropriate resources and learning. Um, I also have to say <clears throat> second that many pre-K private partners are already providing continued learning and supportive resources to families and children. Um, so as Commissioner Rebecca said, don't worry, you didn't steal my thunder. We had 160 early educators on the webinar yesterday, but we had an additional 150 plus. So we were actually at a total of 280, I believe, early educators between today and yesterday who are working, who are getting paid, who are working with their families. And what we were able to do is showcase those who are doing the continuity of learning uh, the best. And we were able to um, share those sort of best practices for how to do this in a developmentally appropriate way from those who are doing it very, very well um, and had a huge response on those webinars. So we will be continuing that. Um, and we also do greatly appreciate the situation the Agency of Education is in. They have been doing incredible work as our other agency you know, partners and collaborators have as well to, as Secretary French said, deal with an incredibly difficult and very quickly evolving situation. Um, everything from providing food to remote learning plans. But in this instance, we do disagree with this guidance. And it sounds like um, we are one of a chorus that does disagree with this. And um, it's not only us uh, from all of our partners that we are hearing uh, from the ground, both in the private setting and the public setting. Uh, we are hearing disagreement of this and we're hearing that folks have been um, bringing this to the agency of ed. So I do hope we can continue to share uh, this perspective directly with the agency um, for perhaps a change uh, here. So um, it just does not make sense to rely exclusively on school district personnel who may not ever have met these families and children as so many have mentioned um, and are being served currently through private partners to provide all this continuity of learning to very vulnerable young children. Um, so uh, I just wanna add a few more points. Um, Pre-K coordinators, you heard from Meg Baker early um, in the testimony. Pre-K coordinators, we believe, 
are invaluable assets to the communities, the schools, private partner programs, um, and in supporting this continued outreach um, and for remote learning for pre-K students. So um, if it's the agency's goal to assure that these common standards of pre-K um, are in place for the remainder of the school year, um, you know, we really believe Let's for Kids that pre-K coordinators have the best understanding of these needs of school-based and private pre-K programs given their role as the linkages between the supervisory unions or school districts, school-based pre-K programs, private pre-K programs, and they're uniquely poised because of their this link in this complex um, system to be able to develop shared practices and guidance on how to do this remote pre-K delivery. So I really appreciate um, the time to share these points since I'm sort of on cleanup here at the end. I really am reiterating what many have said already, but we do um, greatly hope that this guidance is, is reconsidered as so many are urging. And um, we do really uh, appreciate the role that early educators do play right now has been pointed out by many, including the National Association of the Education of Young Children. So thank you very much for the time. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna open it up to questions for anybody that's left in the room. So I, I think uh, most people are, just you can just wave your hand fairly comfortable with the 166 payments continuing to provide that stability everybody's you know you're all pretty good with that idea um and that the guidance needs some work and we also have underestimated uh the talents of some of our pre-k providers in their ability to uh, provide uh, continuity of learning. I, I personally can't imagine going and trying to Zoom with some three-year-old I've never met. I can barely get my three-year-old grandson to pay attention to me when I'm saying happy birthday to him. So um, I just can't imagine a stranger doing that. <laughs> so um, is, is uh, Megan here yet? Oh. Caleb, did I miss you? Oh, look, some questions. Uh, Caleb. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I I just wanted to see if I'm understanding correctly because I know it has been a little on the secretary speaking to this, that there are a couple different program, program which I guess I heard the secretary characterize as something that's kind of there to help parents keep their enrolled spot if they're able to pay the other 50% or some amount negotiated um, by the program. Um, but, but what I'm hearing is that the UPK money, the universal pre-K money is going to flow to those programs uh, irregardless of whether those spots are are maintained, are enrolled. You know, I've heard some things that if a parent uh, or parents choose to, or, or say we can't pay the 50%, we're gonna lose the spot, then a program would be compelled to sort of go through their wait list and see if somebody would take that. But if nobody would take that spot and it was empty, uh, that the universal pre-K money would still be paid for the empty spot. And um, I just wanted to, I guess, first check if I'm understanding that right. If that's if that's correct, that sort of at the end of the day, um, if, if nobody takes this spot, that that whatever money would have come for the student who was enrolled at the beginning of this payment period for the vouchers, um, that that money will be paid regardless. And I don't know, I, I guess that's an open-ended question to anyone who feels they can understand my question and, and can answer it. If I could further clarify the question, uh, for FY20, has all the money already been paid anyway? Meg's looking to answer. I, I was gonna say, I, I can take a stab at it. Um, so all of, most of the districts have prepaid through the end of the school year. Um, so not all, our district paid right about the time that the school closure happened for the remainder of the school year. But we can reconcile for any remaining weeks of the year 
which was initially what we thought we were going to have to do based on the CDD stabilization program. But my understanding about this most recent guidance from the AOE is that the money goes to the program regardless, the, all the Act 166 money goes to the program whether or not that child is enrolled, whether or not they are offering any services. So Caleb, this is sort of addressed to you a little bit. The, the child's enrollment doesn't impact what happens with the funds. The funds are the programs no matter what. Um, I think where it gets complicated is this, this idea of 50% versus 100%. Um, and I think probably um, uh, I would defer to CDD um, secretary um, for that. Maybe you could explain that to us, um, Mr. Barbera, Rebecca. I, I thank you for the question. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to speak on behalf of the Agency of Education uh, and uh, their intent uh, with the program uh, and uh, their decision on how the money will flow. Uh, I can confirm that my understanding is that the UPK dollars will continue to flow to a closed provider, uh, regardless of whether there is a, a child uh, in the slot. I hope that that's helpful. What was the value of the enrolling, unenrolling that Meg was bringing up? I didn't quite follow that one. I'm sorry, ma'am. The there was a question of of where you could unenroll as childcare, but enroll, keep enrolled as pre-K. That that would affect financing. Someone understand that better than I do. I think the secretary pushed back on that when Meg brought it up. Meg, would you mind clarifying that? I wouldn't mind. Um, so if, um, if you think of a, full, a child who's enrolled in a full-time program uh, at having 40 hours a week, many children have more, some children have less, 10 of those hours are pre-K, so a quarter of them, and those are free to that family. They're entirely paid for by the district. The other, in this case, 30 hours would be covered by a combination of perhaps parent private pay or um, the child care financial assistance program in, in typical times. So I think what I'm asking is, can we unenroll from just those 30 hours to maintain the stability, but keep them enrolled for the 10 hours? I, uh, I think I'd feel more comfortable uh, discussing that question with uh, Secretary French or a member of his team um, instead of um, coming up with a response uh, solely on behalf of CDD. It's, that's fine. Um, Sarita Austin, also I did notice that, that Megan Roy is in the room and she probably has answers to some of these questions. <laughs> so Megan, if we're, if we're tossing something around. Um, I'll be I'll be happy to jump in, Kate. I have the same I have the same answer that Meg had to that one. I'm sorry, I'm going to mute myself and figure this out. I was just I'm going to ask my question. Um, can you can someone tell me how many pre-K coordinators there are in the state? Does everybody have access, every district have access or districts like a regional thing have access to a pre-K coordinator? I, Sarita, I can take a stab at that. Um, every district has figured out coordination and many districts have done that. Some districts have done that regionally. Some districts have done that by identifying a coordinator, um, but uh, sometimes that is just something added to others. Um, I mean, I don't, Meg, I don't know if you want, we could talk about the different structures that exist in our region, but it, I don't, it's not universal. Let's go to Chelsea on that. Yeah, we have collected information on that. Um, in terms of the specific numbers, I can't say off the top of my head, um, but Megan is right in that some have regional approaches, some have a specific coordinator for their specific school district or supervisory union. Others are looking to regionalize and um, get coordinators, so do not have one at the moment. And um, 
quite frankly, a lot of them divide the labor amongst positions that already exist. Um, for example, special ed directors um, and other uh, people within the district. So the answer is no, not all of them have it. Um, I would say that pretty universally when I collected information, they all desired to have it uh -huh. um, in some regards. So um, I could get you more specific numbers um, if you would like them, but I can't uh, state them off the top of my head. That was okay. of course in our, in our pre-K bill. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I'm just, the other, the only, one more question is, um, gosh, Kate, what is going on? <laughs> Um, it, I, this is just an educational question, being a former educator, are all, will all four-year-olds have um, some way of transitioning to kindergarten? Is there any more emphasis, like on the four-year-olds that will be going to kindergarten in terms of at least trying to get them, you know, kind of ready, you know, school ready? in terms of when they enter kindergarten? Is there a little bit more emphasis on the four-year-olds? Sarita, do you mean now, given the school closure situation? Yeah, not, not huge, but just, you know, just yeah. to make it a little bit less traumatic transitioning <laughs> cold to a kindergarten. Yeah, I mean, I. I can only speak from the perspective of our district. I know that is something that we don't have an answer to yet, but want to figure that out. Um, and you know, we have we have fairly um, seamless structures with our partner pre-K program. So I think to, at some level, our early ed coordinator, it's a matter of uh, identifying who the kids are and figuring that out. I don't think we have a good answer to it yet, though. But I agree with you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Peter Conlon. Uh, thanks. I just wanted to go back to Ali's uh, testimony, um, and uh, which seems to be sort of in line with with what we've heard. But um, uh, were you implying, or maybe you said it outright, and I just didn't hear that? Yes, in fact, we could. It's not an, it's not an unreasonable expectation to have the private. Uh, pre-K providers to be in charge of the continuity of education for for their clients. Absolutely, and as many said, you know they're getting paid the tuition to do so. Um, you know there are uh, many of them that are doing it. They're just they're just doing it because it's the right thing to yeah. do. They have the relationships yeah. with the families. They've been doing it from day one, well before guidance even came down the pike. So yes, not only can it happen, it is happening in many cases. And I will say, you know. As you know, with the stabilization program and the money flowing from CCFAP and Act 166, you know, many, many programs are keeping uh, their educators on payroll. Um, so they are willing and able, many of them are doing professional development right now at this time. So they are ready and wanting to do this. Um, and, uh, you know, some though, some programs have, um, you know, sort of shuttered their doors, gone on furlough and not participated for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, in the stabilization program. So yes, there are some that would be a little trickier, but what we're seeing in those 280 folks that got on the webinar between today and yesterday, that yes, it's not unreasonable request and many are doing it. Thank you. Um, Caleb Elder. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, kind of open-ended in terms of, or, or open to whoever might want to answer to this question. Um, I, I guess I'm trying to clarify in, in the case where a family again going back to if you don't keep that enrollment so a family chooses or is unable to pay the 50 percent to keep their spot and so they become unenrolled uh if that were to happen does the does the district that is sending the upk funds still have an obligation for continuity of learning for that unenrolled student uh the money is still flowing to the program but the student's been unenrolled I imagine that's not a totally common scenario, but also I'm guessing it's one that exists. So I'm just wondering if anyone's come across that or knows how that would how that would play out in terms of responsibility on the school district's part. Is there a person you're directing that to? Oh, Meg, there we go. 
I actually asked that question today in a phone conversation with agency of education staff um, and was told that they would have to, that there would be additional guidance coming out that would give us more information about that, but there is no answer right now. Okay, um, and then Kathleen. Yeah, thanks. Um, directed to whomever would like to answer, I, I just want to make sure that I really understand how this stabilization program is working. And I, I figure I've got all the right people in the room. So Meg, going back to your scenario, let's take a 40 hour a week um, family in a private provider. So uh, 10 hours are X at publicly funded pre-K, that's an Act 166 voucher. That money is continuing to flow to that private provider regardless. Of the remaining 30 hours, if the family wants to retain their spot, they're being asked to pay 50% of the tuition um, regardless of whether CCFAP is a part of it or not. If they can't, then they're out and the state is paying for that spot at 100%? Yes, and so the easiest way to look at that is if I take you back to that same 40 hour a week kid. Yeah. Our district is paying about $95 a week for those 10 hours. That's your um, Act 166 voucher money. Right, the Act 166 voucher money. Okay. Taking, say, uh, imagining that 100% of tuition for the week is $200, just because it makes it for easy math, not because that's an actual figure. Um, that $95 would be applied first under the okay. way that the guidance has come out from CDD, first to the family's 50%. And so, so the family might then have just $5 left, right? And the CDD stabilization fund would pick up that other hundred dollars, right? Because their total tuition cost is the pre-K funding plus what parents pay or subsidy pays. And, and the way that the guidance reads, pre-K is, is being applied to the parent portion of that 50%. And programs are also allowed to accept less rather than unrolling child, children. Um, so, so if the family couldn't pay that $5 copay, the, the program could say, well, for this period, we're going to exempt the child from having from, from that. And the state would pick up 50%. If they unenroll the child though, they get the full amount up to $360 a week. So provide private providers at this time, um, have a pretty good flow of revenue, they might be out some money on that on that 50% part of the equation that we're talking about. Yes, and in general, depending on how much their total tuition is, right? So, so for some, a program that costs $400 a week is going to be out substantially more. Um, and $200 is not necessarily a reasonable figure, but it made for easy math. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I was really understanding, um, I guess, the context in which we're talking about privates stepping up and taking over these COLs. And I think that I am. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Other questions? Um, I hope that you people will speak, uh, make contact with AOE. Um, as the secretary re reminded us, this is actually not in our uh, bailiwick at this point in time, um, that he'd like to hear from you directly. However, we have found that sometimes this is a, um, this is a good forum. Um, Sandra, did you have something? I'm sorry. No, I was just going to add um, to Kathleen, James, to your question. Um, there's also the payroll protection program that some programs have applied for as well to help protect um, any expenses that they're incurring. Thanks. Okay. 
um, well, that completes this portion. I had thought this was going to take the full two hours, but it didn't. It ended up working out exactly the way we had planned it, Avery, um, that at 3.15, we'd move over to uh, Act 173 delay. But then I canceled everybody, right? Which wasn't too swift. I canceled the most important people, which is the general counsel from the agency and uh, our, our, our counsel. Um, but I, I will, um, maybe we'll take a break for a minute and then we'll let people that don't really want to hear about Act 173 delay um, can go. And if you want to stay and, and do it, that's fine. But why don't we just take a, a five minute break and we'll see if we can get in touch with Jim. That sound good?